Hi, it's Andrew from Risk Academy, and I'm excited to be able to introduce the first session of our understanding module, What Do You Mean by Risk? And over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at the following topics to ensure that you've got a good understanding of what we mean by risk as a concept and how we can go on to apply that in a risk management model. Risk always seems to be a difficult thing to discuss. A lot of this is due to the many different definitions for risk, and we often have instances where similar terms are used to mean very different things. But another big issue is that risk is highly subjective, so what constitutes an actual risk differs from person to person, depending on the perspective. So even if you agree on what risk is conceptually, everyone involved in the discussion will have different examples in mind, which will influence their thinking. In a general discussion, this can prove to be frustrating. But there is a much more serious problem if you're trying to conduct risk-led activities, and I've seen hundreds of hours of work wasted because terms were not agreed at the outset. So if we want to develop a functioning risk management system, we need to ensure that we can agree on definitions and remove some of the subjectivity from the discussion. As a reminder, we're working with a straightforward four-phase risk management system. We begin by understanding the organisation, its objectives and the risks it faces, before moving on to address those risks with strategies to mitigate downside risks or exploit upside risks. Monitoring is an ongoing process to identify any changes to normal operations so that controls and response measures can be implemented. Running behind all of this is a system maintenance process to keep things running smoothly. This three-part framework keeps things simple and is easier to implement than something with six or seven elements but all of the main elements of most risk management systems are still represented in this framework. It's just the structure that is different. In order to make this framework effective, we need a clear definition for risk to underpin the whole of our risk management system. So that's what we're going to move on to look at now. A simple definition and framework for risk that reflects widely recognized terms and concepts. This means that the definition and structure will be straightforward to implement but will also allow this framework to integrate into other risk management systems in the future if necessary. Most importantly, this is an approach that works in practice, so it is something that you can employ in the real world. ISO 73 defines risk as the effect of uncertainty and objectives. This is pretty simple as a definition, but the more I think about it, the more I like it. It stresses that we are considering the effects of events, not the causes, and how these influence an entity's objectives, rather than simply judging risk by the magnitude of an event. For example, flooding by itself isn't necessarily a risk, and in fact some farmers rely on flooding to irrigate their crops, so we need to consider how floods might affect an organization's objectives to determine if this poses a risk or not. This definition also highlights that there's a degree of uncertainty involved, since the type, time and place of an event cannot be anticipated, although we can sometimes make educated guesses. Even if we can anticipate or observe an event, the full effects might not be known for some time. This is a particular issue in technical, tightly coupled, highly integrated systems where the full effects of an event can take some time to emerge. Finally, an additional benefit of this definition is that it works for both positive and negative risks. Although risk is often thought of as a purely negative concept, or our downside risk, this ISO definition also allows for the fact that events can create an advantage or an upside risk. Using the same framework for both types of risk allows for like-by-like -like comparisons, which can be very useful from a decision-making perspective. This definition is a solid start and a robust definition for risk as a concept, but the ISO definition doesn't give us everything we need to develop our risk management system, so we need some additional detail. What follows is a bottom-up framework for individual risk that still aligns with the ISO definition. This framework is both practical and theoretically sound, and with some terminology tweaking, we can still use the same framework for downside and upside risks. In this framework, risk is comprised of three elements. Negative or downside risks are comprised of a threat, vulnerability, and potential impacts, whereas upside risks are comprised of an opportunity, exposure, and potential impacts. Combining these three elements explain the risk posed by a particular event. By separating the key components, this framework allows each element to be addressed separately in the risk assessment and risk treatment processes. This helps prepare clear, understandable risk descriptions and more effective risk treatment plans. So let's look at each of these components in more detail. Threats are the type of events which could negatively affect your objectives. These are often grouped together in categories for simplicity, for example environment, safety, infrastructure, as the same functional team will own these threats, making management of the process easier. 
threat descriptions should stress the effect rather than the cause. So instead of listing climate change as a potential threat, the threat might be increased frequency of flooding in an area. Full descriptions should include the potential likelihood and magnitude of a threat. For upside risks, we would call these events opportunities. The second component of a risk is vulnerability, essentially describing the conditions that allow an event to occur or those that might prevent it. Vulnerabilities exist due to proximity to a threat, because of inadequate preventative measures, or where there are poor or non-existent controls. Conversely, robust controls or separation from a threat will lower vulnerability. Vulnerabilities relate to both physical and non-physical threats, so both poor physical security and weak corporate governance create vulnerabilities. For upside risk, we can use the term exposure. Threats and vulnerabilities are cons considered as pre-event factors on the left-hand side of the risk bow tie, for those of you who are familiar with this idea, as these create the conditions that allow an event to occur. If an event were to occur, we have to consider its effects and the specific impact on the organisation and its objectives, which is the right-hand side of the bow tie. Impact is highly contextual, and it is not always the immediate effect of the event that is being considered. Instead, we should consider the effects that the event has on the organization's objectives, which might be a combination of physical effects, reputational damage, and loss of market share. Again, remember, risk is based on the effect of the event on the organization's objectives, not on the magnitude of the event itself. For example, consider two warehouse fires. A fire that shuts down an Amazon distribution center in the summer would still be a big incident, but is unlikely to affect such a large organization's overall objectives. Conversely, a fire that destroys a small business's only warehouse immediately prior to a period of peak demand would have a major, potentially catastrophic impact. By maintaining an effects-led approach, we ensure that we focus on the impacts on the business and its objectives, not on the event itself. So if we combine these three components, a risk is comprised of an event that poses a threat, vulnerabilities that could allow the negative event to affect the organisation, and an impact on the organisation's objectives. If we combine these together into a risk statement, you can see how these three elements describe a risk in detail. For example, in the statement shown here, you can see the company has described the magnitude of the risk, the threat that is the source of the risk, an impact statement, and a vulnerability statement. This gives us a clear explanation of the events that contribute to this risk, and we can start to see how we can target elements of the risk for treatment. This type of statement also aligns closely with the kind of risk statement that would appear in an enterprise risk management program. This means that in addition to aligning with the ISO definition of risk, this framework is also something that could be incorporated into an ERM framework at a later stage. This approach has several additional benefits. There is no unit for risk, so we cannot measure it as such, but we can use this definition mathematically, so we can show that risk equals threat times vulnerability times impact to give us a basis for quantitative risk assessment. This formula provides quantitative values to allow us to evaluate grade and order risks. In turn, this significantly improves our ability to assign priorities and allocate resources to reduce or exploit risks. Again, we can use the same basic formula for upside risk, but in this case, risk equals opportunity times exposure times impact. A second benefit of this approach is that by separating these components, it makes it much easier to see where mitigation is possible and what effect different treatments could have. Cost-benefit analyses or return on investment calculations can be combined with this approach to determine where resources can be best spent. In the example above, the changing security situation has rendered the existing safety and security arrangements inadequate. Breakdown of law and order is not something that a company can normally influence, so treatment can be focused on reducing vulnerabilities, perhaps by enhancing security measures or by moving manufacturing elsewhere. Alternatively, developing an alternate supply chain as a backup would allow the company to reduce the impact if something did happen. Finally, breaking a risk into these three component parts also helps identify the conditions or triggers that can lead to a risk event. These can be monitored to help prompt additional controls or a response to mitigate an event. As a reminder, it's important to reiterate that risk is particular to the organization's perspective. Two entities in the same place, facing the same situation, may have a very different assessment of the overall risk. For example, swords and weapons makers in Westeros might see unrest as an opportunity, creating an upside risk. We can use a similar format for their risk statement, and we will see that they have a very different perspective on the situation than the company we looked at previously.
I understand this is a silly example. However, it highlights how the same situation will affect different groups in different ways, and it also illustrates how we can use the same framework to support both downside and upside risk. So that's it for our first session of the Understand module. We have covered quite a bit here, but I hope you're now comfortable with the four-phase cycle for risk management, which is the basis for a risk management system. We also now have a simple effective definition for risk as a concept, and we've looked at how we can break a risk into individual components and how these ideas apply to both downside and upside risk. Finally, we looked at how we can use this structure to write detailed risk statements and as the basis for defining a risk mathematically. And these ideas of breaking a risk into its individual component parts and applying quantitative values are the basis for the risk assessment process that we will look at in section two of this module.